Hey there, I'm Pete Townsend, and this is Money Never Sleeps. We look inside the minds of entrepreneurs and at the crossover of startups, enterprise, finance, technology, and life as we know it. In this episode, I'm joined again by guest co-host Maya Santamaria. Maya is the head of the financial advisory unit for the Department of Finance in Ireland. Maya is one of the most helpful people I know and always has a uniquely incisive insight or two on what's going on at the crossover of finance and emerging tech. Maya originally featured on episode five of Money Never Sleeps back in 2018. She made a cameo on her 200th episode. She's a tech star's mentor. She recently helped me make sense of the crossover of blockchain and AI in episode 241. In this episode, Maya and I riff on the topic of digital identity through the lens of the new European digital identity wallet brought forth by the IDIS II legislation and look at digital identity regimes in Latin America through the latest news on new banks expansion. With the investments I'm making right now in early stage ventures in blockchain, Topics like decentralization, over-centralization, and the elements of trust and risk when it comes to how individuals feel about who has access to their data are also a focal point of this chat, all right here on Money Never Sleeps. My Santa Maria, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me back, actually. Awesome to do this again. There's been quite a, a, a circuitous path to get back to this based upon the conversation that you and I had uh, a few weeks back now that then generated some more interest and some more discussion from listeners that then spawned some introductions and things. So during those last few weeks, it's just been a complete tsunami for me. Like I mentioned before we started recording, it's, it's been, but it, the, the big thing is, is that it, it's wonderful to be in the, the position of delivering this great news to founders that yes, we would like to offer them a spot in the Techstars Web3 Accelerator program, but it's kind of heartbreaking and Never mind for me, because it pales in comparison to those that we've had to say no to, you know, of delivering that letdown. So it's the ups and downs of being an investor, but again, pales in the comparison to the ups and downs of being a founder. So Indeed. Brazilians in buckets needed, I'd say. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So coming full circle from our chat around episode 241, that in that chat, Mai, was seminal for me because we got to that crossover of decentralization and AI. And that was from riffing on the intersection of the Vitalik Buterin, DIAC manifesto. Yeah. But you were reading Scary Smart by Mo Gadot at the same time. Did you finish that? Finish that, yeah. I was a bit shocked by the end, so I have to say. As he says in the book, he himself went a different direction through writing it. So I thought he was, I was kind of going that way. And then it was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting the change in the pivot. But yeah. I know the pivot in the story. I know, neither did I. And I kind of flew through the last quarter of the book when I got to that. I just finished it probably about a week ago. Oh, Uh, very good. it, it It was very much eye opening. And so with that chat, what happened was that Niall Dennehy heard that, you know, big shout out to Niall Dennehy yeah. from Aid Tech, and he introduced me to Evan Miazono from Atlas Computing, who has his background in blockchain, and that's now morphed into putting some decentralized or at the very least standards based governance in mm. place around AI and seatbelts in place around AI. Yeah, or well, guardrail. Yeah, guardrail exactly, and we need them. And mm. that's will hopefully is something that I'm going to be digging into a lot more during this upcoming accelerator program, which would be pretty cool. Very good. And so what even started us down this path was that chat that you and I had in BlackRock that day. Well, the name of the place we've been referring to it as something else, but we're, we had hat, we had coffee in Hatch. In Hatch. That's right. But mm-hmm. the, the other, the other name of it. In Nappy Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted. I I didn't know if you wanted to to share that publicly or not. In case you have friends who 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 go there, who go there. That land start. It's not. It's not that Hatch itself is Napi Valley, but it's sort of everywhere around here. It's working from home. Yeah, Napi Valley for for people uh, working in Dublin City. But there you go. Definitely, definitely. When we were chatting that day, yeah, we talked about a number of things, but we talked about the crossover of digital ID and blockchain. Yes, and you started enlightening me about what's happening with digital ID in the EU. Okay. And this is where I could go down a rabbit hole of complexity. I'm going to try to keep it very high level. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question that I posed to you at the time, I was that if digital ID in the EU works as expected, 
than the logic and where everybody is developing in, in digital ID these days is that blockchain is now kind of at a point in terms of its development and its maturity, which is really weird to say, but it is. And yeah. I've, I've seen this through and through over the last six months of looking at all these different companies that are applying to the program, that anything that you're doing in digital ID now, if you want it to be a context of where you can prove your identity or you want users of this digital ID to be able to prove their identity without providing the party that wants to identify you with any of your personal information. You don't want to have to provide them with the personal information. And in the blockchain world, there's something called zero knowledge proofs that enables mm -hmm. this. So I was thinking that if digital ID is a new thing coming out of Europe, but not a new thing the world over, that of course, no. if there's some new regulation around this and new laws around this, that of course, it's going to be built on a blockchain type platform. And that if you do want to be able to have this context of enabling the users of this ID to prove their identity without providing the, the party who is identifying them with their personal information, then of course it will be wrapped with zero knowledge proofs. That is what is necessary if you want to do this in that way and to be able to enable the individual user to keep control of all of their own information. So my point was that, okay, that is wonderful if that is all correct because the big worry about, okay, what else would go into that digital wallet that holds your ID? Well, it's perhaps central bank digital currency. The fear with that is that, well, the central bank or the issuer of that currency will know all of my spending. Yeah. But which, come, yeah. I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah, yeah so I get it. if that digital wallet is built on blockchain with ZK proofs for the ID construct we've been talking about, and it then is used for CBDC, your spending should be private to you. And that was where we ended up that day in Nappy Valley. And I wanted to continue that conversation. Yeah. But I think I answered my own question by prepping yeah. for this chat. For this. I, it's a big question piece. I yep. don't think you quite, have quite answered it because there's so much to unpack. So yep. let, me, let me try to parcel it out a little bit so we can talk about it. See, you know, let's kind of, what is your point of view and maybe the way I see it too. There's a technology piece. So let's park that. That's a blockchain. Zero knowledge proofs, darn that's needed and so forth. Let's just leave that for a little bit. I think there's another parcel, which is the privacy piece. And this will come to transactions and your CBDCs. Then there is, to me, the trust parcel. So this is public services, public governments, how other countries have started and embarked on this journey. And another parcel, I think for me, it's the use. Mm -hmm. What are you going to use the digital wallet for? And when do I need to have a digital ID, ID for? And when? So I think four parcels is more than enough. Otherwise, I think we're going to run out of time. But let me give you some of the thoughts on each one of them. And I'll pick, say, let's pick the use one. If I pick the use one, this allows me to then lay out a little bit why the European Union, the European Commission thought that we needed a digital uh, wallet for identity at the European level and why in Ireland we have the GovID and why there is a dedicated project and the whole program, the EI does, which effectively is to allow for a provision of a digital wallet for EU citizens to use both public services and private services, but to key, the key for me is across the EU. Yep. Okay? That is key. So in that use bucket, let give me, I'll give you an example on a private sector basis, you white, and then we'll look at the public services white. And these are all personal views, my personal experience, and say what you think about this. So many years ago, I was working for Barclays. I had a company car. I was insured under an insurance company whose name may or may not be an important uh, capital city in Switzerland. I had that car for four years. Then I moved to Switzerland itself. Luck have it, I actually ended up with that same insurance company. And I worked with them for six years and I had a company car. So that's four years in uh, England, being insured by them, plus six years in Switzerland. 
luck we had it. Then I moved back to Ireland and I continued to work for that state insurance company. And I wanted to get a car here. So I had a 10 year no claims bonus. But even though my salary had been paid by this state company for all of these years, and I should continue to pay me my salary for all of these years. So they clearly had ability to say where my money was coming and where is it going. I was not able to use any of those private years towards my no claim bonus in Ireland. None at all. Wow. So if you said to me that a digital wallet at a European level would allow me to actually have a token of proof that I am a good driver and I can travel with this anywhere in Europe. Yay. Yeah. yeah. I want to welcome, yeah. I definitely welcome that digital wallet ID. If, with that same use parcel piece, if I look at the provision of public services, okay. And again, this is my own private experience. So back in the days of COVID, for example, Ireland did a fantastic and I mean cracking job at and being at the forefront because what we did here in Ireland with the famous COVID certificate QR code and the app at the very start was yep. actually used. We literally exported that template to other member states and even outside of Europe is my knowledge, right? It was fantastic. So in my case, I had my first injection, my first vaccine, then for personal reasons, I really needed to go and travel to Spain. My dad, as you know, was very, very sick. It was not possible for almost six months time. My mom was his own carer. It really got a point that I really had to travel, but it would have coincided and it coincided with the time that I needed my second boost for the COVID vaccine. I still went because I thought, you know, I really needed it. I think my mom needed me there and I really wanted to be there for my father. I went to Spain and when I was in Spain, um, the local services allowed me to have a second booster so that at least I would be protected while I'm minding my dad. Okay. I came back here. I spent maybe nine months trying to have that second booster for which I had a certificate, a batch number, everything accepted by the HSC in my record. So I had a QR code. Mm -hmm. I could not get a QR code when that was developed because the system unable, it was not possible to recognize second vaccine for which I even had, like I said, literally down to the manufacturer's production code could not be, would not allow, would not have the flexibility to accept that. Okay. Wow. It was fixed almost two years later, but anyway, we moved on. That's fine. So from a public service perspective, if you say to me, I'm going to have a digital wallet that really allowed me to move freely and have a public service given or that I use for in one member state and take into account another member state's a hundred percent, I'll say yes to that. Okay. Totally. But the reality is it's difficult. Yes. And that's just giving yes. you those two points. So on a use case, the technology, I, I have no doubt that will allow it. On the other side is how many operational and legal and regulatory hurdles need to happen for that, for the, what the technology allows for this to be of use to me as a citizen. So the Probably the most the easiest example is the case of the QR code. The technology was there. It was easy. Yet the operational rules of what's allowed yeah. would not accept a foreign vaccine, even though actually it was for the same company that it was due to be given the boost here in Ireland. So that's my few thoughts and news. What do you think of it? Yeah, yeah. I, and I totally agree that the opportunity to have a digital wallet in Europe, anywhere in the world, where you can take your data with you and that data can be trusted and provided to third parties is fantastic. And I, for the majority of it, I will use that because it's my appetite for risk and my uh -huh. willingness to trust. Those two things, risk and trust, are personal. And there's different levels of function of this digital wallet for different purposes. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of it, like you said, public services, that insurance example, all of those kinds of things where my own privacy and who has access to that, as long but as we, those other parties are trusted parties. And you mentioned a bit about that. So, and, and I think that you said is linked to that trust. I mean, a hundred percent. We tend to look at the credentials or the need to present our identity as a trust is more about me trusting. In my case, 
what I had completely ignored and was unaware of is that even if I have it, it needs to be accepted. And the acceptance by the party is what I think needs to be worked on. So mm -hmm. like in the case of the, of, of, the, of the COVID vaccine, I had it. I trusted the HSC completely. They just yep. would not take it. So yep. what it is work that needs to happen for that to actually become is accepted. I just need a blue tick, but I want you to accept the blue tick as it is, as it stands, right? So what do we need to do past the technology that has to happen for that blue tick on our digital identity to be accepted on whatever point of case? And that definitely takes me to the point of trust. And, and we can maybe discuss this. I know we, we, we talked about Argentina and so forth and our last yeah. jobs we, we spoke, right? We trust our identities because generally we trust our governments. They'll keep that data safe. Unpack maybe a little bit what that identity is. Where? Now, at the end of the day, it's not identity, really. It's registration in a country that we are yeah. thinking of digitizing here, okay? I happen to be born in Spain. That's where my birth cert is. That's where I went to school. So my Spanish passport reflects the fact that my records are centrally held in and under Spanish administration. I don't consider myself Spanish. I don't think the Spain passport is my okay. identity. So, you know, to your point of each us individuals having control of our identity and what goes into that digital wallet, um, I would love to be able to say, well, I choose what my identity is or what represents me as a number in that digital realm. It's se separate or somehow is just, listen, I just happen to be born in a particular country where they hold my records. But I also need to trust, obviously, that that administration will actually keep those records safe and nothing would happen with them. It's a trust that I think we kind of, in the Western, more advanced world, we just kind of take for granted. Peace. We do. And this is something we do. We do. We do. And this is it's something that to me was, I was aware of it when working with the World Economic Forum on that cross border stable coin for cross aid disbursements. And again, we discussed privacy of, of the cash disbursements and data. And you just forget, clearly. I mean, sorry, I was aware of the fact that I trust my government to do what they do with my data. It never occurred to me that there might be some, say, African countries, that they might use their personal data against you. Like yeah. whatever religion is in the, in the centralized register or whatever dress you might have or whatever political affiliation you might have. What do you think about that? The element of trust in the Western world, like you said, yeah. in Europe, in the US, but when you go down to Latin America, it's a different story there with the yeah. different political regimes that are in place. To me, this is about centralization versus decentralization. And why I was interested in this, this whole topic, Mai, was because I was expecting the European digital ID framework to be decentralized based upon where technology is and everything. But what I'm reading into this now is that it's clearly not. So no. just in Forbes last week, there was an article, the EU lays the techno legal tracks for its rising digital ecosystem. Yep. And Ignacio Alamillo Domingo, he is a partner at, a, at Digital Credentials for Europe Consortium. And he explains, the digital identity wallet is a super app on your mobile phone that allows users to share their identification and other types of credentials with the highest level of trust, namely the EU government and the member states. So you are trusting the EU government and the member states, and that's who... And like yeah. we were saying, for the majority of this, absolutely, I'm absolutely cool with that. And I will trust the European government and member states. And you could do this without exposing personal details, such as your age, address, or birth date. This is a groundbreaking piece of legislation. However, the obviously, the EU government and the member state will still have that information. They already have that information. They already have so that's it, fine. Yeah. They, that's fine for me. And... Alamio and others propose to use blockchain technology to maintain and track the trust anchor information. All right. So instead of having that held in a government body or an issuing agent, that original information is that it would be decentralized and it would be protected via blockchain technology rather than being protected by a centralized issuer, which is then yep. obviously subject to other nefarious 
third parties, hackers hacking into the technology systems of these issuers, which may not be the most robust given how no. many of them there are. And they're so spread yeah. out around the world. So let's consolidate this on blockchain. That was my view. So so maintain and track the trust and care information, which is a list of parties who are entitled to issue a digital identification or to issue a wallet or issue an attestation for attributes like we were talking about with insurance. But that is not the current plans. There's no blockchain in the current plans. So they're using this thing called public key infrastructure, which sounds like yep. blockchain, but it's not. And so the whole story for me crashed down a bit. But then I started yeah. looking, like, like I said, further west to Latin America. And I saw this story about Nubank and about how they're expanding across the yep. region. And I thought, how could they be doing this at such a low cost model with a fully digital branchless system and where they're engaging in this know your customer authentication yep. that they need to do in order to open bank accounts. But I'd ex I expected in Latin America and countries like Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, yeah. for the ID system to be totally paper-based, but it's not. They jumped ahead. And it's only been in the last year where they've really done this and where it, even in Brazil recently in the last number of months, now this hmm. digital ID is open to everybody. And you know what? Guess what? They built it on blockchain, okay? Now, some of it is 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 private blockchains, which smells of you know centralization, which is fine, but at yeah. least they've made that At least step. it's on blockchain. At least yeah. it's on blockchain. Yeah, and that really opened my eyes. And like I said, in Brazil, in Argentina, like we mentioned, they're issuing mm -hmm. blockchain-based digital ID. This was all news back in October, November, December that I completely missed. Colombia is using digital ID to fight its digital hackers, not using blockchain yet, but you know, it, it's my big question is what proportion of the world cares about whether it's centralized or decentralized? Yeah. And so, listen, if all of this at the end of the day is underpinned by this discussion of trust, right? Do Mexicans or Brazilians or Colombians trust the governments any more or less than we do? They um, probably trust them less than we do. Yeah. So is it, does it feel safer to have an immutable digital ID to have your papers, your hard copy papers in some archive in some old building probably does. Yeah, no, and we're, I, I, I'd like it to be in a context where I can't be canceled um, and yes. I couldn't be removed because those records are cryptographically secured. I think that's yeah. the crux of this. Not that it's protected by blockchain, it's that they're cryptographically but it's secured. But wasn't it though as well, maybe potentially an element of the fact that you have, it's digitally available, that particularly in those countries where they're just leapfrogging all these hundreds of years of hard yeah. copy papers I, and systems, it opens the world. Like, you know, you have something that is borderless to have somehow the digital ID is made already to work across and beyond your potentially your your country and into a region. Whereas we're not in that mindset because of where we are in Europe, you know? I mean, exactly. there's, there's a legacy it, premium, unfortunately, to pay, which I think is what we're suffering in Europe. Yeah. And because when you're living in countries that have the economic, I wouldn't call it complete equality, but a lot more economic no. equality across no. citizens than in, a, in other countries, that so living in Europe, we, we certainly have a lot more economic equality across the board, but there again, big pockets of where it's not. Yeah, we've grown up in a regime where paper ID, plastic card ID, all of that is completely fine. And then credentials and being able to keep track of that, be able to prove who you are and being able to prove your property rights and all that type of stuff. There's an element of trust there. And yeah, yeah in different countries in Latin America, that's not always the case. And so we've had it easy on yes. a relative basis. The like you, that leapfrog, like you mentioned, Mai, that to me was very reminiscent of what happened in China 15, 16 years ago, or where hmm. there, the financial services in yes. China were just very old school, very difficult, but technology allowed a leapfrog there where the growing middle class went right to digital. Listen, I 100% agree. Is very, it feels like that. 
is just the barriers aren't there to overcome. So you can leapfrog the what stirs you down. As you were mentioning the new bank piece of news there, Pete, actually to me was reminiscent of the early noughties when I was working in Barclays and we're expanding the Barclay card business in Africa. Because it's very similar. Like, I mean, new bank, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it really started as a as as a provider of retail credit cards, right? Yeah. And what do you need for a retail credit card? So that's the way it was, like, say, in, in, in East and West Africa when we had it there, is you hand in a plastic and a, and a, and a limit, credit limit, you know? But you usually need an address and a phone number because yeah. people can get the credit card, use it up and so forth. So that obviously leads to high default rates, as you know, and certainly was something that kills a lot of the business during the um, the economic crisis. You know, you might remember yep. the days of the news of all the cars parked in, in Dubai Airport. They were Just all, left there. Yeah, yeah, default loans. So New Bank follows that same kind of model. So there's an element of AML needed, but because it's credit card, it's retail credit card, we're not talking about the like of transactions that you would need for a proper full-fledged AML. But from a business perspective, from a default rate perspective, what percentage of their retail customers would default at a potentially, I'm guessing, looking, thinking again to my hand from no bank, their interest rate is probably pushing 20%. You know, there's some credit card providers in Spain have rates of 33%. So it's not that bad when I think about what's happening, even in Europe. Mad, but true. So there's an element of how you offset this potential low AML personal data default rates or customers with the obviously profits on the interest rates on those customers that you do and can go after. So at the end yeah. of the day, is a risk trade-off. Yeah, so, it, 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 it's interesting because the new bank model, and that's what I was really questioning here, was that mm. they, they've, they've moved into profitability. They're looking at approaching the, the billion dollar revenue figure. Yeah. And just looking at this branchless banking model and starting out with credit cards, like you mentioned, and yep. starting out with a very different type of credit scoring model. And where there are things that are in that new bank model, such as they will determine your risk profile based upon who referred you to New Bank, and what is that person's go. risk profile? Because generally, that's it, your community, your group of friends, perhaps, mm. will be similar in risk profile to you, and they found that that works. And that so there just kind of step stepping back and, and and putting in these different types of technology and challenging the old guard and being able to actually now at this stage with digital ID in their core markets of Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico, they're able to move even faster with authenticating people. Yep. And it just kind of bring it back to, to the point. Mm. I was trying to point to Newbank as an example to say that, listen, we've got a major financial services player here that has been able to gather millions of customers on the basis of a completely digital model. Yeah, That digital model has a dependency on identifying individuals. Over the last year, that identification function for New Bank ha is becoming far easier because they have these digital IDs that are trusted. And that element of trust is something that I think is at the cornerstone of what we're talking about here with how will the rest of the world feel about digital ID, I've looked at what the US are doing. It's yeah. all a bit backwards. They yes. still require, even if you have a digital ID, you still have to carry your physical one with you. I know, just in case. Mm. So, and, and then swinging it back to Europe, I mean, we've got a situation here where, like I said, I, I was hoping it was the dream situation. Yeah. It is for but the majority of it, the majority of it. Yeah. And having a digital ID, like I said, I will use that. But when it comes to, there's something else that is in this framework here, which is you can use this digital ID to identify yourself online with platforms like Facebook, Meta, Instagram, whatever you want to call them, and other social media in the same way that you can identify yourself with Google. And I'm like, do I really want to turn that on? Yeah. And who is actually holding all that data? If it's not being done in a decentralized way, I don't want to do that. But I will use it for the medical, for the identification. Correct. The registration with countries, like you're saying, is a much better way to look at it. 
but there's, I just think the whole story and I'm wondering, well, do, do people really care about this? That's my big thing. I do, are people, but the majority well, do of care. people don't. Yeah. Well, I don't think, do they care? Well, maybe because there's no need for us. I mean, we're humans, you know, we're, we're just animal beasts at the end of the day. Like I think <laughs> when you have the need for it, you know, when it's a burning issue, then you kind of wake up to it. So do we really need, I mean, it's like in my case, right? Like, I mean, I would have loved to have some kind of centralized and mutable proof that I did have my no plane bonus and I would have been a lot richer, you know, for those two years. So from a pocket perspective, I suppose, there's like where it really hits us. So if I pick up the case of Dubank and the digital ID there, there's two things brings to mind straight away, okay? I don't really, I don't know the process of, for obtaining a, a digital ID, but I'm guessing the actual government of those countries follows some kind of process that at least allows yep. for a confirmation of that ID. So this person has this face, that face is in this passport or, or mortgage, whatever it might be, even birth certificates or something, it must be some kind of, of, of process that follows that identity. So people that up until now have either willingly avoided the process or didn't know that had to work the process or didn't have to need, will actually go through the process of getting the digital ID because of what it gets them. So yeah. there's a benefit to them, which is, look, I get to have a credit card, which is easy to use with no cost. I don't have to make a queue. In some cases, geographically remote branches cannot be accessible. You have to remember, I mean, think about Brazil. There are places that geographically, you couldn't put an ATM even if you wanted, but you might be able to charge a mobile phone. Okay, that's just the reality of life. So the digital ID has enabled and notched citizens to go through a registration identification process that otherwise would not have gone through. Yes. That's to me, which is like, that's great, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, maybe it's not great if you don't want to be in the grade in the first place, but that's a different conversation to have. On the other side, I'm like, how come? Those countries have been able to do it so quickly. And here in Europe, we need so long to achieve the same aim. It's the leapfrog. It, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's like people in the U.S. don't understand the context of stable coins and why it's, there's such a big benefit to less yeah. developed countries in that you know if you want to move $10,000 from me to my aunt in the US, right? It boom, you go through like that. You could do it on Venmo, no fees, nothing. No. But if you want to try to move, let's use my currency skills here. What's the currency? The Argentinian peso, right? Well done. You want to move that to mm. say to the US or say move it to Europe. You're going to be paying huge fees off of that. Yes. And so yeah. why not just hold that in stable coins in US dollar and inflation protect that? based upon mm. what's going on in your own home country and just move that. And you can do that through stable coins. People are like, there's no use case for stable coins. I'm like, yes, there is just, there's 330 million people in the U S that is what yep. less than 5% of the world's population. Okay. Uh -huh. There's billions more people out there in the world that need this type of stuff in Europe. We're going to look at a lot of these digital ID things, kind of compare it to what we have right now and say whether it's yeah. better or not. That, that's a question. Question I have for you, Maya, on this is that, you know, with digital ID, say with Dubank, for example, and with implementing digital ID in Brazil, that if you go to open up a new bank account, instead of you having to do a selfie scan, show a paper ID, and submit a utility bill, if that's even the regime in Brazil, I don't know this for sure, that instead of doing that, you get this little part on the app that when you say, okay, go to sign up for this. Would you like to use your Brazil issued digital ID to identify yourself with us? You hit yes and boom, it's integrated. The API works to connect new banks yep. backend system to the issuer of that in the Brazil government and you're identified, new bank can trust that. Do you feel any more or less comfortable about that than the current regime of say you opening a Revolut account on this side of the pond and you going through that selfie scan, that passport scan and then having Revolut hold all that information for you and your personal information being exposed to Revolut's own cyber security. Which one do you feel more comfortable with? 
and I made out on the second one and having to go through and have that risk time and time again, every time you need something. Exactly. Which is what's happening today. So maybe I've already answered your, your, your question here. It, it's a better situation if you put that into Europe with Europe's digital ID and the digital wallet. Mm. I would be happy to open a bank account using a, a digital ID issued by a European government. But I wouldn't use that same thing to authenticate my login to Google or 100%. Facebook or anything like that because who knows where that information is going to end up. And even just when you authentic authenticate through Google and Gmail and all your mm. private correspondence and things like that, I wouldn't use it for that. But I, th I think, again, this comes back to trust and risk and, and how yes. we feel as humans, as animals. I love that you've definitely brought me to a, a point here to think of. I just 100% agree. And you really forced me to think about it as you, would, you were outlining there the two examples. And it's a little bit personally as my relationship with money, right? Money was always something that you had, paper, credit card, and you use it for everything. It didn't matter, okay? Mm -hmm. Whereas with cryptocurrencies and stable coins, you started to enter the likes of Revolution, digital banks. You started to choose how you want to use your money, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an this analogy I've used before. We don't just have one mode of transport. We have many ways we can actually go from A to B. And we choose what we use depending on a combination of several factors. How much time do I have to get there? How long is it? How fast do I need to go? Even the weather, okay? You get to choose from A to B. We've never done that. We've never done it with money. Mm -hmm. We've just accepted there was one way to go from A to B and that's it. And sometimes it would take a long time and we just pay for it. Yeah, particularly cross-border transactions. Not, we've just, and sometimes there was no need for it. I like the way money is evolving to give us that choice to yes. say, depending on my personal circumstances and what's available to me and my needs, I will pay this way or this way, right? So you just provoked that thought in me, which is why shouldn't it have to be any different with digital identification? I'm not talking about digital ID, but difficult identification. Like I went to college, I've got my degrees. I'd love to have just a QR code or selection. You have your primary degree, your postgrad, whatever it has. You keep those as QR codes in my wallet. I don't need them every time, but every time you apply for a new job, it would be great to just show off my QR code. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to have copies. I don't like to have to send copies of all of those certificates to all of those you know, future employers. I don't know what they're doing with them. You know, yeah, there's a long list to say that do X and Y and Z, but I don't have hundred percent confidence that they will keep. You know, they'll keep it there. That would be even safer for them if they know that QR code. You know, definitely is verified. It's got its blue tick, and it says my definitely qualified doing this degree at this time at this. And with that, that's very different from the data. I'm love to have a QR code that says this is my address, date of birth, blah blah blah. I'm tired of having to call. And having to repeat the same time, time and time again. You know, you go to the doctor, I'm like, I've been coming here for six years. Do you really need my date of birth again? How many My Santa Marias are there in Dublin? Not to mention Ireland. <laughs> and I still one. have to... <laughs> I know there's another uh, Santa Maria who worked in Mercer. I need to reach out to him someday. Oliver, I think. But it's, I mean, you know, it's like, it's really like, do I need to do this all over again? It would be so lovely to say, here's my QR code, everything's been checked, you know, there you go. So I love this idea of using that, I, that having the digital identity, depending on the use and how I choose to, to and what I, I choose to disclose. The same way that I think blockchain and cryptocurrencies has really, for me at least, really challenged me in approaching the different ways I get to pay for. So why should there have to be any difference for this national, sorry, digital ID, whether there's a national ID or whether there's credentials or whether there's something else? No, what do you think about that? No, no, I, I agree. And it's a, it, 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 that crossover is real interesting, that analogy between mode of transport, mode of transaction, and mode of identification. Not identification from an ID standpoint, what we all know is these IDs, formerly paper, still plastic, and eventually yeah. digital. But yeah. how how is it that I need to prove that I am who I say I am? And yeah. 
I, it, uh, again, I, I've just been so, call it, infected by what I do every day in the blockchain space. And that even mm-hmm. me saying that, that I am who I say I am, or that you know that I know yeah. what you know. And those types of things are all totally fluent to me when it comes to blockchain technology. I couldn't code a damn yeah. thing, but I can tell you a little bit about how it works. And that's, that's where this whole thing came from for me. All of this goes hand in hand, your financial lives with your mm. identity and who you are. Mm. And yeah. sometimes, and, and not just your financial lives, but your, your history, what have you done in your life? All yeah. these types of things all get wrapped in with money. And money can be an in- proof of purchase, right? That and yeah. receipts and all of these types of things that we can digitalize and that will become digitalized. There's so much interconnectivity here when you start talking about it in the context of a digital wallet, because that digital wallet and whoever issued that to you, if that is an app that is issued to you by a centralized issuer that is holding custody of that data for you and perhaps that value for you, that is that at risk? What I think is that for the majority of the population, the majority of the 8 billion people on this planet, they don't care. No. They're like, make it as easy as possible for me to, to, do, to, to run my life. But exactly. there is growing concerns and where those concerns are coming from are from the lesser developed countries where people's identities can be canceled. People's access to Gmail can be canceled. People's access to GitHub yeah. to get their code can be canceled. Can be canceled. All of that just taken away from you. And so that's yeah. where I am a big proponent of the decentralized element of this. But I think mm. what we're saying is that for the grand scheme of things over the next five to 10 years, where we see the European model developing and perhaps other big economies, such as the US, starting to take notice is that it's going to be incredibly centralized. But yeah. the majority of the population won't care in these developed countries. In the under in the less developed countries, it is currently a problem and will continue to be a problem. And I think that is I'm not going to point to, you know, to any country and say that it's less developed because that's all relative sense, right? That yes. the less developed countries are perhaps at least making a attempt to do this on blockchain. Are they just vulnerable to wonderful technologists that say this should be on blockchain, you shouldn't do it any other way and they trust them? I don't know. Well, I think, well, two things maybe just to bookend how you've outlined what we've discussed so far (laughs) there so beautifully. I don't think that cancelling any more can be said is a risk of the developing countries. I mean, remember the track protests in Canada? Bank accounts were stopped and seized. I wouldn't think that Canada is a developing country. So there you go. It's like no longer something that you go, you know, let's, let's, let's cancel that. So I think that's that's important, number one. Second is. is, I I don't know, and this goes back to the very original question, how many people will care if eventually there is a, a new digital wallet that all their digitalized credentials and identity markers are in the same wallet as potentially their digital euro, okay? I don't know how much would they care. In terms of privacy of information where I spend my money, there's no privacy. If you're using a credit card or bank account, that information data is known. Yes, the Central Bank of Ireland does not know that level of detail, but you know, effectively as as the data is, is certainly available to the pro, to the it providers is. to you of that service. So that's just the it's already known, right? So if you watch any movies, the only way you don't get caught by the feds is by, you know, the FBI, whatever. It's just like not using your credit card and go around with your uh, queen back in your pocket. So yep. they already know our transactions. And if if the digital euro moves forward with this idea of definitely not used for investment, just used as a, as a transactional uh, point of almost sale, and they continue with limiting to maybe 3,000 euro, I mean the level of transactions that are going to be and the risk of anything happening up to 3,000 euro is quite concise. You know, it's going to be very, it's not like it's completely going to be open-ended and you can do digital euros to buy houses. That's not going to be the case. Yeah. So yeah. whether it be, there's also talks about maybe potentially limiting the use of digital euro by account. So one account per person. But then, and that's where it gets interesting. 
since we all have different systems in Europe, some have national ID cards, some don't. Some have passport numbers, have some like here PPS numbers. How can you possibly ensure in an, any centralized manner that is one person, one account? Okay. I would yeah. not know that. But interestingly enough, and this is something that I really wanted to discuss with you and I just came back to me, is more than having this digital ID and maybe potentially the digital euro into it, which I don't think might be a goer. Early, late 2017, early 2018, there was a professor in Trinity who did a project on voting using Monero. Was it Zcash? So it could be that maybe the way to go about this is that you get your vote in your digital ID wallet, and that could be used then for elections here or elections at the European level. That, to me, would be a lot more useful to most European citizens than actually having the digital euro in their wallets. And I so think being, that able to vote, being able to vote through your wallet rather than having digital euro in your wallet. Yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, there, there have been, I have seen a number of blockchain-based proposals for voting in the US. Yeah. Some of them have got traction and some of them are, are up and running and being used already. And if you can consolidate that in, geez, there's so much that gets hooked into your vote. Um, and it, it's easier, it goes faster, tamper-proof. Like the whole process, like even from a citizen's perspective, it would make our say so much more valuable because it would be quicker to affect the operational machinery needed to actually go through, to have urns, to have papers, to have lists, to have absolutely everything. So personally, that's probably where I see more value from a citizen's perspective, our ability to influence decisions in a way that it's timely, Ooh. timely, faster, quicker, because we're moving digitally and it's taking, like, think what's happening now in Ireland with the referendum. You know, imagine, like, and maybe I'm influenced in this thinking about it because of the time I spent, you know, we're in, we lived in Switzerland for, for six years. They were having a referendum every second week about something. I was like, how do these guys do it? You know, like we were not able to do one every two years. Like, I mean, it was literally for the smallest of things, you know, like, should we change the bin collection from Tuesdays to Thursdays? Boom, referendum. But it worked, you know, it was fast. There was a high degree of, of participation and it just happened. And I'm just like... Think about the change in dynamics in a society that, yes, you get your national ID, maybe, you know, for different uses, but the fact that actually that becomes your vote, I think that would be more powerful than just using the digital ID for your 3,000 digital euros that these guys might ever get, you know, ever give me. I, I, I would love to change my bin collection date. I absolutely would. <laughs> and I'd love two green bins instead of one because it's ridiculous. You should move to Switzerland but, but, then. But, 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 I mean, I, I'm, I'm sensing this from... You know, yes, given my time in crypto and my appreciation for alternative mindsets around self-sovereign money, financial lives, identity, that I'm naturally going to be more pushbacky on my identity being intertwined with my financial life. However, yeah. your point is twofold. One, Pete, it already is. That data is already there, and the government the re who regulate those providers of financial services that you use today are already able, through their regulatory oversight of those institutions, are able to able to get your data because they can get it when, yeah. they, when they want it. If I'm spending entirely through stablecoins right now to be self-sovereign with my money, that actually that needs to be off-ramped through MasterCard or Visa if I'm actually going to be able to spend stablecoin directly from my wallet. Um, yep. I can't conduct the majority of my fan financial life through crypto right now. I may be able to in the future, but as yep. of right now, 95% of my spending is already, that data is already obtainable by the powers that be. At the, at the and, on and, and off ramp. So let's not look at it from the perspective of, hey, is a digital identity wallet good or bad because of what a result may be from a central bank digital currency? It's think about the evolution of a digital identity wallet into an overall digital ecosystem for people's lives, for yep. government services, for other things, and what could then become digitalized at the government level because of this ability to have 
these decisions being made in the palm of people's hands on their smartphones. And I think yep. that's a lot more powerful proposition where we start thinking about a digital wallet in Europe as kind of a bizarro world version of WeChat in Asia, where you've got so many different things within this WeChat ecosystem on this app, from shopping to public transportation, to payments, to financial services. And yeah. let's start thinking about the digital wallet in Europe in the context of what could you actually do digitally? What is a government-sponsored service? And how could we actually digitalize that to make people's lives easier? Wow. Okay. That's a good place to round this out. <laughs> let's just say, I know I, I brought the whole idea of the digital, the digital wallets during our discussion. The more I think about it, I'm a little bit hurt, I suppose. Let's just say, yes, yeah, a little bit sad at how the discussion on the project is not being used to empower us as mm. citizens and almost like belittle us a little bit, you know? Let's just give them 3,000 euros so they can spend it on now the sweet shop in the corner. I'm like, well, if you're going to choose my identity, allow me to use it for the things that matter. Yeah. So that's my, there was something in me like, I actually, you know, you could do so much more better. Yeah. I want to put a down payment on a house in Spain and that's going to cost me a lot more than 3,000 euro. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, but so there's, there's so much more. It's the potential. I suppose it, it hurts me that the potential of what could be done and how much of it could be done for us in Europe to improve our, that life cycle, our lives here, it's just missed. It is. It is. But Europe is progressive. The thing about European legislation is that they're never meant to tackle everything in the first mm -hmm. fight. Oh, we'll right? get there. We will, we will get there. And I think the result of this conversation for me, my, is that I'm overthinking yeah. it from a centralization versus decentralization perspective is that for the majority of this stuff, it doesn't matter in the longer term, it will matter. But as for right now and trying to make those first big steps forward, you know, you just need to be supportive of it, embrace it and, and, and move ahead. And because it's a slight shift in our current framework uh, that we're all living in right now in the digital world. You know, it's just, it, it'll be a consolidation entity and make things a lot easier for people. But I may, yeah. I may edit that part out about embracing it, but because <laughs> I can't still just, <laughs> what's happened to me? <laughs> like, <laughs> right, I think, I think in Europe, any step forward needs to be celebrated, you know, just it like does. your baby Absolutely. trying to do their first steps. So yeah, I'm not going to run a marathon. I'd I rather have them, you know. I know. Do, but, do we uh, want to tackle yeah. cross-border taxation now? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. All right. Well, well my, see. yeah, no, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to touch that. No. But listen, this is a good place to leave it. And I think we've we've rounded out and you've allowed me to scratch this itch. So thank you. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. It's been, yeah, always love talking to you, Pete. I mean, you, you definitely force me and allow me to to think it largely and I love it it's great thank you so much awesome that does it for this week folks and you can learn more about the stories we covered in the show notes on our website moneyneversleeps.ie thanks to my Santa Maria for all the insights she shared in co-hosting this episode with me if you like what you heard please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify as it helps others to find the show also thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for mixing and editing this episode Conan is an excellent media man to get in touch with when you're thinking about launching your own podcast. As for me, I'm an early stage startup investor focused on where fintech meets crypto and crypto meets Web3, and I lead the Techstars Web3 Accelerator. There are plenty of links in the show notes on moneyneversleeps.ie on how to get in touch, so don't hesitate to reach out. Finally, until next time, thanks for listening. See ya! Money never sleeps, but